Well, thanks for coming this evening. My name is Alan Marquette. I manage the community education programs for the Science Center. And uh, we have some, uh, a really neat program this evening, but there's a few other ones I wanted to tell you about for the rest of the month. Um, we have the Audubon program, which is normally on a Tuesday, is because of scheduling, is going to be this Friday, this next Friday. And uh, it's, it's the 25 day float trip through the Grand Canyon. And it's by local Cordova residents. So they're going to be showing and talking about the things they saw, the wildlife, and some of the excitement of going down the Colorado River. So because that's also the night that, when there's a lot of volleyball stuff going on, they are going to uh, show it again in the courthouse here at 7 o'clock on Sunday. So the program will be here on Friday night at 7 o'clock and on Sunday. And so folks that can make it at that time can come to the second showing. The other thing I wanted to mention is that you may have noticed the, that we've got a, a video camera going. And I've been talking with um, Cindy at the um, GCI. And they have the equipment they're going to start videotaping as many of these programs as possible and then showing them on the cable channel at certain times. And so whenever they do that, I'll find out when they're going to occur, and I'll send out an email to folks that couldn't make it or are interested in seeing the program. So that should be a new venue for, for catching these programs if somebody misses them. And, uh, and the other program that I wanted to mention that's really going to be a cool program, it's the last one of the month, and it's by uh, Charles Woolforth. And he's an author, and his, his, his program is titled Nature and Human Nature, um, Are We Capable of the Cooperation Needed to Save the Oceans? And so let me just read this briefly to you because it sounds like a really cool program. Charles Woolforth, author of the, the Fate of Nature and the Whale and the Supercomputer, explores how culture, not technology, holds the key to humankind's ability to cooperate to solve global environmental problems, including climate change, <coughs> ocean acidification, overfishing, and oil spills. His home in Alaska provides a microcosm of conflicting worldviews that lead to different fates for our relationship to the Earth. The talk includes dozens of spectacular photographs of Alaska's Prince William Sound as Woolforth peels back the issues to our cultural roots to answer the question, do we have the capacity to cooperate as we need to in order to preserve the oceans? So I've heard he's an excellent speaker, and, he'll, and I think they have some of his books at the bookstore, too. So, so with that, I'd like to introduce our program tonight. We have uh, various students here from the high school. and. Kara Johnson is here. She's their mentor, and she is their um, coach for the NOSB, which is the National Ocean, Ocean Science Bowl. And I'll let her introduce the students and tell you more about the program. Hi, thank you so much for coming out. Um, so the National Ocean Sciences Bowl is a nationwide competition, and they hold regional competitions. So the Alaska competition is called the Tsunami Bowl. It's held in Seward, and it is the first weekend in March this year. So part of that competition here in Alaska, we're unique in that we are required to not only compete in the Quiz Bowl, which is the Jeopardy-style trivia contest about ocean sciences that the entire nation competes in, but in Alaska, we also have another component, and that's a research project. So any team that wants to go for the gold and try to win, they must compete a research project. So of our two teams this year for Nose Bowl, uh, we have the Nefarious Dog Sharks, and then we also have the Urchin Queens. Um, the Dog Sharks are the only ones who are doing a, a research project this year. And so as part of their practice and training and help work out the kinks, we like to have them present at the community lecture series. And it's also a way that they can give back a little bit of the support that you've shown them through the fundraisers that we hold um, during the winter. So our Nefarious Stock Sharks um, are led by James Allen as the captain. We have Ben Marrakes, Keegan Crowley, who is not here, unfortunately, tonight, but will be here next week, Sophia Myers, and Adam Tamudio. And just also want to say thank you to all of the parents for your support in uh, with these kids because they couldn't do it without you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Would you like to have the other lights out too, or it'll work better? Leave it on. Okay. So uh, I was going to introduce us, but that's already been done. So uh, without any further ado, this is uh, crabs, corals, and conservation. Managing the Lucian King Crab through the preservation of cold water coral gardens. 
as you can see here, the Aleutian Archipelago is a part of the Alaskan Peninsula, and it extends 1,900 uh, kilometers all the way to the Kachemak Peninsula <coughs> in Russia. It's a uh, row of islands that sits on top of the Aleutian Ridge, and it separates the North Pacific Ocean, which is about 4,000 meters deep, and the Bering Sea, which is uh, 1,550 meters deep. Now, the interesting thing is uh, it has a lot of strong tidal currents plus intense nutrient exchange and uh, the oceanographic and geologic conditions plus a lot of volcanic substrates that lead to an ecologically rich area that sports a number of uh, commercially viable stocks of marine species. Some of these are Pacific cod, black rockfish, perch, pollock, and golden king crab. They are harvested in a variety of ways, including long lining, uh, long line crab potting, just single crab potting, and bottom trouble. So, um, the, oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> Most of these fishing uh, efforts go down to about 950, but are focused really at around 200 meters. And crab potting, in particular, goes down to about 750 meters, but focuses on 300 meters. So one unique thing in the Russian <coughs> archipelago is the presence of coral and sponge communities called coral gardens. As you can see, that this is a little just a distribution map. And uh, they go down to about 800 meters, but are most commonly found at about 150 meters. So these uh, coral gardens in the Aleutians are actually some of the most diverse in the world. Uh, there are 86 different taxa, and uh, they some of them are uh, there are hydro corals, stony corals, uh, those are sea pens and sea whips, uh, gorgonian corals, uh, there's more hydro corals, and black corals. <laughs> In fact, 25 of these are unique to the Aleutian archipelago. Uh, the complex benthic habitats uh, that these coral gardens form uh, make nurseries for a lot of juvenile ground fish and uh, sort of a buffer from threats such as strong tidal currents and predators and uh, they're very long-lived, uh, up to, well, actually we don't quite know how long they live. I've, you know, I've heard from 125 to 400 years long, so in between there. <laughs> it's a video that will pop up shortly. However, these uh, coral gardens and target species of marine life are often in the same place, and uh, fishing can harm the coral. You saw a bit of it there. Uh, trawling especially, that was an example of bottom trawling. It removes the coral and nobody knows exactly what a coral recovery time is because no one's lived long enough to see or record a coral garden recover itself. A uh, bycatch of coral in the coral gardens has been reported back to the 1900s when trawling began in the Aleutian area. In fact, uh, 82 metric tons is predicted to be trawled up per year by ground fishing. So this project hopes to look at uh, coral gardens plus the Golden King crab fishery to you know, incorporate one into the other and review historical and economic significance of each, uh, identify primary threats to the both of them, and devise a multi-species management plan to reduce damage to the coral gardens while maintaining a high catch rate of the Golden King crab. And with that, here is back. Okay, my section is on the ecology of the coral. There's a shot you saw earlier. As you can see, they're quite colorful, quite diverse, like the kind of thing you want to see when you go snorkeling in tropical shallow waters. And here's a shot of the kind of coral you actually do see in tropical shallow waters. This outer layer here is called the xanthalay, and that uses the sun's energy to create energy and food, and that in turn grows the coral. So here's a shot of the kind of corals that we have in the deep waters of the Aleutian Ridge. Um, because it's too deep for the, it's deeper than the depth of light penetration, they don't have these uh, xanthalae, and that means, because they don't have the xanthalae because it wouldn't make sense because there's no light. And that means they still can grow, but they don't grow as fast, and when they get damaged, it takes a long time for them to heal. So here's a shot of the uh, spatial distribution of the corals. 
Uh, the Gorgonians are the most abundant. They're the ones with red dots there. Along this uh, 169 west parallel, there's a major shift in the abundance and the diversity of the corals. And this is because of the currents in that area and the amount of nutrients. And farther left, it's a lot better for different kinds of corals and a lot more diverse. Uh, the red dots, I said earlier, they're like Gorgonians. And there's a shot of Gorgonias there. Kind of spongy, like uh, rotter corals. And they are the most abundant along the pollution ridge. Uh, here's a graph of the depth distribution of the corals. Um, trawling, we found it, uh, they focus between 75 and 325 meters, but they can go deeper than that. And you can see there is significant overlap in the corals there, and the corals on the Aleutian Ridge, they're centered, well, I guess their average is about 150 meters, so that sits right in the depth of trawl. So there is significant overlap in both the spatial distribution of where they're on the map and the depth distribution of where they are in the water. Uh, the reason we want to protect these corals is because there's all kinds of different species that live in them. Uh, when they're little, they use them as spawning sites and areas of protection for the juveniles. Uh, as they grow older, they use them as areas for prey abundance. And essentially, they're like nurseries for the fish. There's a sculpin under a gorgonian, a, uh, there's a polyp, I don't think there's a polyp right there, and of course, a uh, crab. Uh, you might be wondering what the importance of protecting these corals is. They're just down there, they don't make much sense, but because we in Alaska harvest so many different kinds of commercial species, and these species, I guess 85% of them, spend some time of life in deep water habitats, including areas inhabited by the cold water corals. So if we protect the corals, we protect the fish, and we protect the Alaska economy and livelihood. And there's the different kinds of crab, the three top most economically important ones, red coming first, blue, and golden. And as you can see, golden goes right along the Aleutian Archipelago there. And so the target species we chose for this project is the golden king crab because they're the most <coughs> centered around the Aleutian Archipelago. Uh, there's a critter right there, kind of. Uh, it's less known right now because not as economically important, but we found its, like, it's uh, populations have been steadier over the years. It's not as susceptible to overfishing as the red king, red king crab is. And it sits right along the, that range we've been talking about, the range of corals. And uh, when they're juveniles, they depend on the corals. I, the shot earlier was of a golden king crab sitting on a coral. And their depth distribution is right on the range of trawling. So if we take out the corals by trawling, uh, we take out the golden king crab and we take the last king crabby. So this section should be for King Crowley, but he's in Florida right now, so I'm taking it over. Um, history of the golden king crab fishery. Uh, they've been catching them since, I'm sure, earlier than that, but the first time they were recorded was 1975, 1976. Uh, the first season they were directly fished was in 1981. And then uh, after that, from 1985 to 1990, they were harvested in huge amounts. 11.9 11, uh, 11 million pounds per year was their average in that time. Oh, sorry, i got to get my acronym here. Uh, the GHL is the guideline harvest level. And that was set because they were harvesting such huge amounts before that. The guideline harvest level was set in at 5.9 million pounds per year in 1996 season. And that was reduced to 5.7 million later. And in 2006-2007, it was changed to the TAC, which stands for the Total Allowable Catch. And that was kept, that stayed at 5.7 million until 2007-2008. And that was increased to 6 million in 2008, and they're still at that today. A few facts about the fishery. Uh, it's the only fishery in Alaska that, o it, the only way the fishies is with long lines rather than the single pots, the kind you see on deadliest catch, just the huge ones they throw over. Uh, in 2005, 2006, the same year they had the TAC, they changed it to a quota fishery by crab rationalization, which means there's no more derby, there's a certain amount they catch every year, and that together adds up to six million pounds per year. And here is Adam to talk a little bit about the economics of this fishery. 
So uh, the value of the golden king crab market is really determined by a number of factors. Uh, they're smaller and uh, than other crab and have a milder flavor. It doesn't look like it, but... <laughs> um, however, they are more abundant and be can be sold fresh rather than frozen and brine, like other species of crab. Also, they have a lower price point, which mean, in demand, the price point is the sort of peak between the waves. And it's uh, particularly valuable in smaller businesses where price point is a major consideration. And so it's a growing market, not only the continent of the United States, but in Japan, or as my team refers to it, the uh, United Utopia of Big Red Button. <laughs> heard some of this, but um, in the 1980s, the Red King crab stock collapsed after the largest season with $115.3 million. And at the time, the Golden King crab fishery started up in Alaska and has been steadily rising ever since. And uh, it still earns significantly less than Red King crab and Bering Sea snow crab or Blue King crab. The populations for both other types of crab have declined, uh, while Golden King crab has stayed steady leaving it open for exploitation. And there is a processing capacity for places, for it in places like Dutch Harbor. So it can't be a profitable fishery. So as you can see, employment and uh, size and positions have dropped in 2005. They have rose through 2009, and the mean crew size stayed about the same. And employment in the fishery will, is predicted to steadily increase because days spent fishing have increased as well. Uh, you'll notice some empty. Just the, as part of the rationalization that was mentioned earlier, one thing about it is that it makes uh, information semi-confidential, as in not available to the public. So a lot of these figures are from past years. That's just kind of why that is. <laughs> also, uh, income for fishermen. Uh, the income for the fishermen has been on the rise since 2006. In 2008. <coughs> The uh, mean crew captain payment per vessel was 0.15 million, while the mean crew payment per vessel was 0.34 million. <laughs> and now here's James. <laughs> All right, so the corals provide uh, protection for both juvenile and adult king crab. That's the most important thing. You want to keep the uh, them alive and well. <clears throat> so the first threat is ocean acidification for the corals. It causes both well, reduced mass and reduced calcification. And because these are slow growing corals, uh, we really need to provide protection for them. And also, ocean acidification causes reduced mass and reduced calcification in uh, the crabs. And this causes a thinner outer shell, so they are more receptive to damage and other things. So here is a bycatch distribution. This is the relative amount of Gregorian. Ergonian's corals caught per set. Uh, habitat degradation. As I said before, they provide habit habitat protection and reproduction for the corals and crabs, along with other species along there. And here we have the uh, depths of damage proportions here. So here's the 100 meter, 150 meter range. As, and that's where the average amount of corals are. And here, we have the most damage, and that is from the trawling, which is also in the 100 meter range to 300 meter range, but it has the ability to go up to 800 plus meters. So here's different gear types. Again, the trawling is the highest overall damage. The severity of the damage is highest, and also the affected area is highest. The trawling has the ability to reach up to 120 meters. That's the uh, trawl tires and the trawl line. So it's a really long and destructive piece of machinery, piece of uh, technology. Also there's long lines and long line pots and set, single set pots. And they aren't as high damaging as the trawling, but they still have an impact. And here's the video. So there you can see the trawl tires in black, just uh, going over the bottom floor. And there you can see fish and other things going into it, and also the corals and other ground species 
just being blown out. You see, here you can see the rock just devastating the floor. And yeah, they leave long serrations, about 120 meters. And now here's Sophie with the plan. Almost anything can be used for an artificial reef. They have used cars, they've used tires, subway cars, um, just oil rigs, ships, basically anything hard can be something used for an artificial reef. Second part of our plan is trawl restrictions. These are in place over a significant portion of the Aleutian Islands, actually all of that blue area right there. So what we would like to do is sort of, instead of this blanket policy, we'd like to go with more of a patchwork so that we can expand this blue area to cover coral guards that aren't currently protected. And we would also like to open areas inside that blue that have been shown not to contain coral. By doing this, we hope that we could focus our efforts on preserving both the corals and not completely shutting out bottom trawling, still leaving them an area that they can trawl without harming the ecosystem and still make a decent profit. The third point of our three-point plan is crab hatcheries. This, these are two shots from the Elliptic Pride Shellfish Hatchery in Seward, which is currently experimenting with the hatching, re rearing, and remote releasing of red and blue king crab. Now, golden king crab is not on the list, but there's no reason to think that their techniques will not extrapolate out to a certain species. Um, the biggest challenge to rearing king crab is that they are just ridiculously cannibalistic. They have to be separated from each other at a very early age or they will simply devour each other. <laughs> the problem with this is that it means for every thousand eggs they hatch, they only get one crab to releasable size, which is like twice the size of like this little guy over here. The caracals has to be about as big as a quarter before they can be released with any viability. And what we're hoping to do with these coral programs is provide a remote release site where these crabs can be dumped maybe when they're closer to this size or even maybe this size and they won't be immediately sucked up by the first thing that swims along. At this point, since we don't use coral gardens for remote release sites, if you just dump a crab onto a silty bottom and it has nowhere to hide, the first thing that comes along just sucks it up and that's the end of your one in a thousand crab. So we're just hoping to use these corals for remote release sites and in doing so, lower the age of viability and thus the viability of the entire crab hatchery enterprise. 
So we've estimated the yearly cost to be about $2 million. The running cost of the entire alluded price shellfish hatchery is currently about $600,000. We estimate you need half of this to run a purely crab hatchery. Um, we've also allotted $600,000 for the enforcement of the regulations that we propose be put in place, the patchwork regulations, and about a million dollars for coral reef rebuilding, subway cars, cars, reef balls, whatever. We, to cover this cost, we propose a crab tax at 2% of the gross profit for all red and golden king crabbers for the Aleutian Islands and Bristol Bay. This <coughs> crab tax would raise about 2.4 million a year, give or take, depending on the year. And we believe that any surplus from this $2.4 million crab tax, estimated about $400,000, could be put to um, fishermen's education or even scouting out to find new coral gardens. For the specifically the artificial reef portion of the cost, there's a U.S. Maritime Association artificial reef program. They were responsible for the subway car reefs we saw earlier. And they provide grants for the promotion of reefs and corals for the purpose of fishing, commercial, and sport. So, in conclusion, here's Adam to finish us off. So you've seen data that has shown that king crab are an integral part of Alaskan's economy. And research that has shown that juvenile king crab are highly dependent on uh, cold water corals for coming from predators and this makes the cold waters vital to the health of future crab stocks as well as the stocks of other Alaskan species. And these corals are slow growing and as such are vulnerable to damages, most notably from bottom trawling. Bottom trawling turns the seafloor, eradicates corals, scrapes everything up, you know, captures bycatch and crabs, corals, other fish, you know, and uh, it's, we are hoping that uh, in order to preserve these cor corals and further the Alaskan crab fishery, we uh, <laughs> propose several measures, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. And uh, each part of this plan has been worked over so that it can be done independently or together with the other components because there is the possibility that it may not be practical or feasible to implement all of the parts at once. So we're hoping that these management solutions provide, may provide assistance with maintaining a sustainable and profitable fishery and an intact ecosystem in the Aleutian Islands. Thank you, and any questions? Is there, has there been any research done in Changing the method of harvest from bottom trolling to plot and long line to the species that bottom trawlers target? Not that we know of. You might want to you might want to have something along that line. Can you repeat the second part of the question? Yes.